last year, with some of us here present, uh, to launch this series of Royal Colloquia. Uh, prior to that, I was considering with uh, Greg uh, a choice of topics. And uh, last year, the topic came pretty much as uh, naturally as possible because the year 2017 rang the bell of 1917. So the discussion last year in our conference was about uh, utopia and revolution. Uh, all the uh, paper, I mean, the presentations were taped as they are now. And uh, you can watch them on uh, YouTube. Uh, this year, uh, yet another anniversary presented itself to our attention, and that is uh, 1968. There's an obvious choice as well. Uh, hence our subtitle, which is Counterculture, Ideology, Utopia. We are going to tackle these three interrelated issues and a lot more uh, over these two days. Uh, and we start with a presentation by Gregory Clays today, which is pretty much, let's say, setting the, the table, the, the field for the discussion uh, over the days to come. So, Greg, go ahead. Thank you kindly. Well, I have the honor of opening this conference. Uh, I want to start uh, jumping in the deep end. So I'm going to do out of the three facets of our subject, the countercultural side, and ignore much of the rest for reasons that will be, I think, partially obvious from what I present. I want to start by setting the stage, so to speak, with a song, which is my starting point in the talk. Uh, we've commenced with the words of a song, which some of you may be familiar with, by a group called the Youngbloods, released in 1967. The song is called Get Together. The key refrain, which you may have been able to pick up here, is come on people now, smile on your brother, everybody get together, try to love one another right now. So I, this, I think, is, works very well. And some of you may recognize that it appeared on the title page of the great Bible of the so-called counterculture. Uh, Charles Reich's The Greening of America, which appeared in 1971. So everybody associates the academic study of the subject, in fact, with this entry point through the music. So let's start then with 1968. In the affluent West, clearly, it was great if you were there and in the right place to exult in the meaninglessness of affluence, to turn on, tune in, and drop out amidst the wafts of incense and hashish, to watch the flashing colors move rhythmically with the throbbing music, clutch at the willing bodies promising the transcendence of repression and the swift and easy surrender of your virginity. If, of course, you were not too young for this experience. This was the swinging 60s. And it was cool, groovy, and far out beyond words. If your eyes were streaming with tear gas, if someone's tanks were tearing up your streets, if you were being scapegoated for your regime's failures, if the secret police were harassing you constantly, and the only swinging was batons on flesh, it was not so great. Even if you knew you were at a nodal moment in history. A lot of us had the feeling up at the time. 1968 clearly represented the confluence of many different movements and events, not all of which we'll have time to address. From January to August, the Prague Spring and Soviet suppression. In February, the Tet Offensive. In March, the massacres at My Lai, which explode into world public opinion late the following year. The upsurge of anti-Semitism in Poland, in April, the assassination of Martin Luther King. In May, Les Evenements, of course, in Paris. The
the largest series of strikes in French history which follow. In June, the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, who, of course, uh, symbolized his brother's legacy. Throughout the year, a series of progressions of student movements, anti-war agitations, black liberation, anti-imperial struggle, the continuation of, in China of the Maoist Cultural Revolution, the revival of the young Marx, the progress of sexual liberation, the growth of toleration, the supposed expansion of consciousness, and of course, much else besides. In the US and much of Western Europe, at least, this represents a generalized revolt against a monoculture centered on older white male, largely middle class experience, chiefly in the name of one ideal, though it's not doesn't always appear in this form, the ideal equality, meaning also, of course, an attack upon hierarchies, technocratic, political, academic, and otherwise, and portrayed often in terms of freedom and liberation, hence the liberation of my title. Most observers would now reckon, I think, but please do feel free to disagree, that these events and movements contain two main countervailing but overlapping trends. It has become fashionable to contrast the two faces of 1968, the countercultural and the political, by way of lamenting the failures of both. The divisions were obvious even at the time. Abby Hoffman, of course, the famous American radical, was chased off the stage at Woodstock, the seminal moment in the development of the American counterculture, by a member of the Who wielding a guitar for trying to introduce politics into the concert. The Yippies were sometimes described as Marxists in the tradition of Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Karl. Mockery thus comes easily in our assessment now uh, this much later. Daniel Bell, an acerbic critic of these trends, uh, asserts that the epoch is dominated, quote, by an anti-cognitive, anti-intellectual mood, fixated upon the Dionysiac and apolyptic, exulting in a new sensibility defined by a genuineness of feeling which uh, for Bell, represents, quote, less a counterculture than a counterfeit culture, a damning condemnation. This is, Bell continues, little more than a children's crusade that sought, quote, to eliminate the line between fantasy and reality and act out in life its impulses under the banner of liberation. While purporting to be an attack on technocratic society, it represented little less, Bell condemns, uh, than an attack on reason itself. And was a longing, he continues, for the lost gratifications of an idealized childhood. Well, this is a very uh, strong condemnation, clearly, but we need to take it on board. The ultimate question I want to ask out of all of this, and which I think is as far as at least the countercultural aspect of these two days' proceedings, is, is this a progressive movement in the counterculture? And also, of course, then, what does it mean to ask that question? All of the key terms are, of course, themselves subject to very considerable debate, disagreement, and so on. Humanity never lose, moves forward without setbacks. That's clear. Was the counterculture a movement forward, however, or itself a setback, which requires surpassing? So it's worth, then, us, I think, considering today uh, how uh, gains were made particularly in light of the present, and I do have an eye here as a card-carrying utopian, uh, to the future. So what can we say about these movements which cast any kind of light, in particular those of us uh, who engage with young people on a regular basis, uh, on the present generation of the young, the generation who would have been rebelling in 1968, and those who will follow them. So let me start then by simply asking what happened vis-a-vis -vis the counterculture, how we should understand these developments, and then finally the question of relevance. What happened depends very much on where you were. The experience in my orientation here is mostly Anglo-American. The experience of Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco was not that of Detroit or Chicago, 
nor even of black Oakland, only across the bay, much less of Prague or of Warsaw, Bucharest, Paris, or London. There were certain global trends, that much is clear, the youth culture and its clothes, music, impatience with bourgeois conventionalism. This culture was subversive in both East and West alike. There's still a case, I think, for seeing the Beatles as having done as much to destroy communism as Stalinism did, Lenin against Lenin, so to speak. Both East and West had lived under the shadow of the bomb for 20 years. Many of us remember this from our childhood. Both had come to fear it. The young of both East and West sought political change, but the differences between reforming Stalinist bureaucracies and capitalist military industrial complexes were great. And there were major fissures, too. In the US, the civil rights movement had been building its momentum for well over a decade at this point. The Vietnam War, while an issue of importance in Western Europe, was central to American political consciousness in 1968. But few of us would probably concede with Jerry Rubin today that the cause of the Vietnam War lay in puritanical sexual repression. Let me proceed by first looking at the countercultural currents which flowed into 1968, then briefly look at the political movements, and then say something about the tension between them. I'll try to conclude that we can characterize 1968 as a moment of what we might term global liminality, when expectations about modernity came to a head only to suffer defeat in part at least, yet also serving to demarcate the horizons of possible human and social development for the coming epoch, that's to say the epoch of our students rather than of us. This can be understood as a moment of cultural as well as emotional purification, akin to a ritual renewal of tribal identity, but concentrated on a baby boomer generational rite of passage into maturity. The concept of the generation, of course, is absolutely crucial to understanding this period. So, as we're all doubtless aware, the emergence of what came to be called the counterculture represented the fusion of a number of different trends in the mid-1960s, most of which can be regarded as part of the same broadly liberal current, which produced the widespread abolition of the death penalty, the birth of the environmental movement, sympathy for inhabitants of the third world, a loosening of divorce laws, and so on. More prominent still, to the degree uh, to which we often assume them to define the epoch, were the sexual revolution brought about by the birth control pill, the availability of so-called recreational drugs, marijuana in particular, the popularity of new spiritual and religious ideas drawing from Eastern philosophies like Buddhism, particularly in the form of a mysticism which was understood uh, as what Rozak called, quote, the essential religious impulse exiled from our culture. That's to say, excluded from bourgeois conventionalism. In addition to this, the ecstatic trend, of course, in popular music, we'd need to play this a great deal louder to get a sense of that. The sense of the failure of middle class values to provide enduring and authentic life ideals valid for the younger generation, and the extension of the hedonistic ideals of precisely that same middle class to a new stage of pleasure beyond work, without sacrifice, and raptured in ludic emotion. The counterculture had its roots in the bohemian beatnik generation of Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg, in the rebellions of James Dean and Elvis Presley, Bob Dylan, in the Beatles and mass music festival, the concept itself, whose parallels with earlier utopian expressions of the euphoric are clear. It broke from respectability precisely when the Moppets, the Beatles as they were then called because of the fringe haircuts, abandoned coat and tie, you may some of you remember this moment, for tie-dyed psychedelia. This occurs just exactly in the period we're thinking about. Now, by 1967, in music, clothing, hairstyle, disaffected youth, especially the most privileged, attained a distinctive identity. In came Paisley, the miniskirt, 
bell-bottom trousers, long hair for men and women alike, and a vast amount of additional decoration to boot. As the hemlines, the symbolic restraint of the boring old society rose, so did the expectations of the novelties and delights to come. This identity had the potential not only to challenge, but to overturn the existing order. Well, contentious uh, formulation. Indeed, its constant fluidity challenged the very idea of fixed identity based on anything other than the ever-mutating experience of consumption and the consumption of experience. The two begin to merge into one another in just this period. In its opposition to a life based on possessions, money, and bourgeois values generally, it had some echoes with the more romantic rebels of the preceding century. The Woodstock generation, as they would come to be called, saw themselves as representing an entirely new way of being, predicated on an ethos of togetherness, sharing, and belonging, which was quasi-religious as well as, of course, profoundly delusional. Didn't seem that way at the time, of course. We see these combined in the contemporary demand for, I'm quoting here from the period, total freedom, total experience. It's a wonderful concept, isn't it? Total love. All these total concepts are wonderful. Peace and mutual affection. This communal ideal, for such it is, in part only, was moreover wedded to an ideology of freedom expressed in terms of liberation and emancipation, which implied not only a release from the trammels of social oppression, but the attainment of some higher state of consciousness and insight into the cosmos. The counterculture had an ascetic want-suppressing side, which stressed simplicity of life and identities not based on ownership, domination, and consumption. At the same time, it was an extension of precisely that consumerism which was notionally being rejected. We want everything was one Paris slogan of 1968. Now, interestingly enough, slogan from one slogan from the Maoist Cultural Revolution of 1966 was overthrow everything. Not we want everything, but overthrow everything. Think of both of these concepts for a while until you get your head into a complete twist. Drugs provided, which is the best way to enter into this, the perfect symbol of the new synthesis. What has been called an expression of the baby boomers' boundless faith in science, they reflected the mentality that personal perfection required only a mental transformation. So the personal precedes the political. If, as the late Sigmund Bauman has written, consumer society rests its case on the promise to satisfy human desires in a way no other society in the past could do or dream of doing, then this moment represents not the negation, but the apogee of such desires, albeit with a greater emphasis, at least temporarily, on being over having. A, uh, conflict often expressed in exactly these terms in this period. From about 1966, drug use marked one of the essential fault lines between the old culture and the new, demarcating the colorful, turned-on, hip, progressive heads, as they were called, or freaks, from the juicers, boozers, or squares of their parents' generation. The former's self-proclaimed avant-garde headed by Timothy Leary, Ken Kesey, Richard Alpert, who became known as Ram Das, and so on, had moved from marijuana to LSD by 1968. All the heads were generally against the war as well as the ethos of corporate America, with its robotic work ethic and vapid pleasures. All this, they felt, fell well short of life's potential and was now condemned as superficial, repressed, ugly, stupid, and hateful. Contrasted to it were images of Indian gurus and Buddhas, the smell of incense, the chanting of mantras, the sighs of love, the electric ecstasy of the grateful dead. Against a guarantee of a life of stultifying, competitive corporate slavery, was juxtaposed the promise of enlightened mystical union with the cosmos, 
endless sexual delight, and a warm, embracing communality of outlook. For millions, this was not such a hard choice to make. You put it this starkly, after all. This was, therefore, a romantic or expressive, largely anti-political movement, which represents a revolution in sociability, in which the staid formality of middle-class conventional bourgeois norms was explicitly rejected in favor of an ideal of authentic, less formal, sentimental rather than rational, sincere and more egalitarian personal engagement. If capitalism tends to reduce all personal relations to a mechanistic and instrumental search for profit and pleasure, as a form of humanism, the counterculture both broke from and yet also in endorsing hedonism reinforced some parts of this ethos. So the events and movements I've described so far, of course, overlap with many other trends, most notably, as I've mentioned, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and resistance to US involvement in uh, the Vietnam War. Student radicalism escalates very sharply in 1967-68, uh, exactly as the US presence in Vietnam expands, with increasing reports of civilian deaths in Vietnam as a consequence of the war, increasing reports in turn of the corruption and unpopularity of the South Vietnamese government amongst its own population. Then in uh, early 1968, the prospect of the defeat of the American forces with the onset of the Tet Offensive, which seemingly negated in precisely this moment the prospect of any optimistic spin upon the war itself. This spelt a moment which lasted for some months of profound disenchantment with post-war American foreign policy. Some of the legacy, of course, is very much still with us uh, at the present moment. And a shift in perception, also very marked parallels uh, this year, from the US as the white-hatted good guy galloping in uh, to save the day in international order. A Ken an image which both the Kennedys, of course, had strived to maintain, to an altogether more dark and sinister, squalid reality of power mongering, greed, and dare one say it today, America first ism. The years 1967 to 69, from a summer of love in San Francisco, which announced the hippie experience, to the great festival at Woodstock, which kind of bookend both of ends of this experience, mark the apogee of the counterculture. So only two crucial years. These two moments clearly fed upon one another, the music, the dope, the antagonism to middle class culture, and the work ethic lending fuel to serious political criticisms of the capitalist system and corporate dominance, precisely as we enter the year 1968. To remind ourselves of the overlap between these developments, let's recall very briefly some of the leading slogans of precisely this moment. Some of these you will remember, others are less familiar. Never trust anyone over 30. Of course, when you reach 30, some doubt has to be cast upon this. The most famous, perhaps, of the whole epoch, tune in, turn on, drop out. Make love, not war, also symbolic of the entire epoch. Ho, 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 chi min, we will fight and we will win, the great street chant. The more I make love, the more I make the revolution, and we will come back to this. Long live communication, down with telecommunication. Commodities are the opium of the people. There are, they all have wonderful resonances today. Better living through chemistry. This was one of Leary's favorites. <laughs> all you need is love. Well, we still have the song to bear that one out. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. The sort of thing you find on your hotel room desk when you enter an American hotel. Uh, revolution is the ecstasy of history. Well, I think we disposed of that one last year. Reality sucks, I like that one. The personal is the political, also very famous. This is the age of Aquarius, note the millenarian overtones there. Black is beautiful, and finally one of my personal favorites, professors, you are old. <laughs> to which my report today, my retort today is old but bold. <laughs> that usually keeps them quiet temporarily. To write the intellectual history of this epoch, it's possible to discern, as Theodore Rozak put it in his seminal study, the making of a counterculture. 
in his words, a continuum of thought and experience among the young, which links together the new left sociology of Mills, the Freudian Marxism of Herbert Marcuse, the Gestalt therapy anarchism of Paul Goodman, the apocalyptic body mysticism of Norman Brown, the Zen-based psychotherapy of Alan Watts, and finally, Timothy Leary's impenetrable occult narcissism, wherein the world and its woes may shrink at last to the side of a moat in one's private psychedelic void. At the theoretical level, the most serious fusion of the two main trends of this era came through the writings, of course, of Marcuse, whose works from Berlin to Los Angeles spanned the old radical narrative and the new hedonism. Everybody here, if you're old enough to remember, will recall the central themes of Eros and Civilization, of One Dimensional Man, the essay on liberation, and so on, which describes uh, in many ways the process in which the two great trends, political revolt and counterculture, might potentially be accommodated, be married in a meeting ground here. Many others would echo these themes, of course, the radical psychiatrist R.D. Lang proclaiming, we are born into a world where alienation awaits us. We are potentially men, but are, he didn't say men and women, but are in an alienated state, and this state is simply not a natural system. But the counterculture and political radicalism also conflicted with one another at a number of key levels. The late Tom Wolf, author of the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, published in 1968, an experiment in stream of consciousness journalism said that acid, LSD, was destroying the new left on the West Coast and producing a mentality which rejected the old so-called political games, politics as such. The acid guru, Timothy Leary, founder of the League for Spiritual Discovery, if now derided as, quote, the great charlatan of the sacramental underground, dismissed contemporary political action and said that the free speech movement was, quote, playing right onto the game boards of the administration and the police, and denied the value of any social action, quote, unless it's based on expanded consciousness, which meant, of course, Leary's version of what expanded consciousness consisted of. The counterculture was, of course, in many respects, centered upon individuality, Indeed, a politics of authenticity, a common phrase coming out of analyses of this period, in which, as Marshall Berman insisted, the expression of individuality, of being oneself, was the aim of community as such. And this is perhaps the most perplexing but central contradiction in the entire schema. Even if this implied a radical redesign of society itself. Individual and cultural change, in other words, had to precede organized rebellion. The revolution of a new generation, Charles Wright promised, will originate with the individual and with culture, and it will change the political structure only as its final act. And of course, this puts the schema of causation uh, understood by many of those, both the old and the new lab, uh, profoundly in a contradictory position. The ultimate transformation here is conceived often virtually in religious terms. It promises, I'm quoting again, a higher reason, a more human community, and a new and liberated individual. Its ultimate creation will be a new and enduring wholeness and beauty, a renewed relationship of man to himself, to other men, and again, it's gendered, to society, to nature, and to the land. All this you can get out of Marx's Paris manuscripts, of course. Their protest and rebellion, this is talking about this generation, their culture, clothes, music, drugs, ways of thought, and liberated lifestyle are not a passing fad or form of dissent and refusal, nor are they in any sense irrational. This is right speaking. It promises this movement a life that is more liberated and more beautiful than any man has known. And this is the question, perhaps, which hangs over the whole of what I'm talking about here. The new generation, thought Reich, had recognized that friendship has been coated over with a layer of impenetrable artificiality as men strive to live roles designed for them. 
you could lift this straight out of Rousseau's discourse on the origins of inequality, of course, or uh, the confessions. It sought instead the new movement, that is, new forms of relationship in the recognition of people's need for each other, which would take the form of being wholly honest with others, use no one as a means, and reject what Reich terms relationships of authority and subservience. The new consciousness, quote, seen in smiles on the streets, had begun to transform and humanize the landscape. Beneath the sentimental gibberish and generational advertising slogans, so, there is clearly a theory of sociability, which is crying <coughs> to emerge here. From one angle, then, this transformation clearly had social dimensions. At the very least, the Che Guevara poster was on the wall, symbolizing international solidarity. From another viewpoint, however, it was intensely an individual movement, facing Che on the opposite wall without any hint of incongruity was Jimi Hendrix or Mick Jagger. Acid and mescaline dictated individuation, self-reflection, introspection, and immersion in the consciousness of being. By dramatically altering our perceptions of space and time, it was contended, they could break down barriers between individuals and instigate an enthralling, rapturous experience of nature. They demonstrated, certainly, at least, just how liquid identity is, to use again a term of Bauman, uh, agreeably adapted from Marx. But these voyages to inner space by pioneering psychonauts, as they were called, uh, or called themselves, were almost inherently anti-organizational and experience-centered. Communion with the shamans, the mystical priests, as Carlos Castaneda commended, as a means of re-enchanting the universe and returning to an age of magic, think Harry Potter, was always intensely personal. This hedonistic emphasis conflicted strongly with the puritanism of the old left and to some degree even that of the civil rights movement. Because the counterculture also spawned its own commodities in the form of cool clothes, hairstyles, a demand for drugs and music, it was also relatively easily co-opted by mainstream society, which saw an opportunity for vast profits and eventually swallowed the new styles entirely, as it had every other preceding social trend. And so the youth culture became the youth market, as youth desires became marketized, youth experiences became commodified, and freedom came to be defined as a choice between commodities. And youth itself, prolonged infinitely through the never-ending shedding of the snakeskins of previous identities, of yesterday's discarded possessions, came more than ever to be heralded as the ideal state of humanity. <clears throat> But more than anything else, the me decade, which is also sometimes referred to, where everyone was encouraged to do their own thing, was intensely individualistic and narcissistic, and was easily transformed, as Sheila Robotham has noted, who's written a marvelous memoir of this period, into a justification of living completely for yourself. It celebrated the body beautiful as a release from repression and as a fountain of infinite pleasure and unending youth. It celebrated the emancipated mind as a temple of the new reason or unreason, as you please. It celebrated instant gratification over delay, repression, and the salvation of savings accounts, exchanging the credit card swipe for sweat-tainted lucre. Its constant conscious remaking of identity and demand for constant stimulation now symbolized today by the wait for the new phone call, the ping of the email, the eternal connection with our phones, corresponded vitally to capitalism's ever-renewing cycles of consumption. Thus, liberation descended easily into the psychobabble and irrationality of New Age spiritualism. Its music may often have been experienced collectively, but it was not intrinsically rebellious. Janis Joplin famously said that her music, quote, isn't supposed to make you riot, it's supposed to make you fuck. So, some tentative 
conclusions, the relevance uh, issue. Millions would experience and later describe their encounter with the 1960s as liberating. Millions gladly abandoned the lifestyles and beliefs of their parents and grandparents and fused with delight and novelty uh, and plain fun in the creativity, the excitement, the innovation, the constant challenges to authority which to so many defined the epoch. Some would describe it as, quote, one long Indian summer of shining brightness, long hair, short dresses, long legs, an experience of metaphysical joy and utopian sharing. If this was not utopia, it was at least cornucopia, the land of cocaine, I'll avoid the obvious pun here, a place of universal bounty where the curse of eternal labor has seemingly been lifted. And it had echoes, too, in the pastoral, the long-lost golden age, and a romantic nostalgia for pre-industrial society, an endorsement of some of that primitivist nobility, rebellion and noble savagery, which Aldous Huxley's Brave New World had both lauded and satirized so well. It has become fashionable, of course, to dismiss derisively, or at least to mock and laugh at, much of what I have so far discussed today. This can, this entire range of experiences, be seen as a kind of Disneyland writ large, a regression to infantilism, juvenile, immature, the product of the overheated fantasies of the spoiled children of the bourgeoisie, and most of all, Americans, for whom Ken and Barbie, if you recall the dolls, which are symbolic of this era, are the new Adam and Eve. It was perhaps all this but it was also more. Few of the great names of this period have weathered the storms of time particularly well. Few turn today to Marcuse's rendition of Marx's account of alienation, seeking emancipation or liberation, which isn't to say it couldn't happen. Fewer still return to Leary or even to the Huxley of the Doors of Perception, 1954, uh, the text which really begins this particular movement. The half-century-long war on drugs may well have been lost. Even Canada has gone to pot now. But the countercultural ethos which accompanied its widespread social introduction is scarcely to be seen. San Francisco was swallowed by Silicon Valley. Some of its youth dropped out, had babies with names like Sunshine, and disappeared off the map of civilization. The rest grew up became bummed out or disillusioned or were co-opted or stunned into silent submission by the virile counter-counter culture of Christian zealots who took heart at the triumph of Reagan, who mocked, uh, this is Reagan, the hippie as someone, quote, who dresses like Tarzan, has hair like Jane, and smells like cheetah. <laughs> You all remember the references. Tarzan was extremely popular, I believe, in Eastern Europe and throughout this he period. He came from Timisoara. Uh, Tarzan <laughs> from Timisoara, right. The door of idealism, I'm quoting here, opened briefly and then was slammed shut. To the British radical Tariq Ali, quote, during the last two decades of the 20th century, utopia was erased from the map of the world. In its place, there emerged a Washington consensus embodying a neoliberal dystopia. Writing in 2005, Ali adds that the politics of 1968 often tend to be ignored amongst the sentiments that the music, the new sexual permissiveness, and so on, a form of happy mysticism represents the true inner meaning of 1968. To another veteran of the epoch, it became clear that we were entirely wrong in a belief that if we smoked enough dope and screwed enough people, the world would be transformed. The revolution brought in and Eden replanted. And so it seems we no longer claim to be alienated and no longer seek liberation or emancipation. The explosive antagonisms of 1968 have seemingly run their course, sucked into the vortex of the infinite seduction of desire, the delight in what sparkles and glints and the images that move so bewitchingly, the exuberant snake in Ken and Barbie's paradise. Yet the utopias of 1968 retain a profound relevance, this is me now speaking, which lies uh, to the century which lies before us. 
whose threats seemingly vastly outweigh its promises. Six themes, I think, indicate this relevance. The first is the fact that 1968 represented a surge in democratic demand against entrenched and largely authoritarian structures, be they the university, the military, political machines, corporate cap uh, corporate capitalist corporations, or Stalinist bureaucracies. Remaking the world in the image of hyper-bureaucratic corporations aimed only at revenue extraction seemed repulsive then. Populist and other forms of democratic assertion now again indicate that restrictions on sovereignty and political expression are, of course, a key theme for this century before us. Egalitarianism is on the march to wither, however, remains entirely unclear. Participatory democracy was, of course, one of the key demands of the new left in 1968. And we begin now to hear these echoes again in an epoch when the power of plutocracy is much stronger than it was in this period. The second is that much of what made the 1960s as a whole such a distinctive epoch was the generational nature, which I've tried to stress here, of the revolt it marked. Once again now, we begin to see hints that this generational resentment will come to the fore. A sense of worldwide generational consciousness occurred for the first time in this epoch. That's really what is the most singular, perhaps most prominent single characteristic. It heralded, though it did not yet mark, the creation of a single homogeneous world culture. Even in France, it was fundamentally, as Alain Turin has written, more social movement than political action. Thirdly, a rights and identity-based politics grew out of the 1960s, which has not yet even reached fruition. This is particularly the case with respect to abortion rights, feminism, and the full recognition of sexual identities, which vary from the mainstream ideal. <coughs> feminism, in particular, was sidelined by and in the counterculture, where women were often regarded as chicks, subject to even greater male demand than in the wider society. So it's kind of actually two steps forward, maybe two back, one back, three back, I'm not sure. And there's a tension uh, throughout this period in this regard. We shouldn't forget that James Bond and Hugh Hefner were mainstream heroes throughout this period. Blacks were often at the margins throughout the uh, counterculture rather than at the center of any other movement than their own, and they were underreported constantly throughout this period. The Yippie proclamation that, quote, long hair makes us the new niggers sounds very hollow indeed today. The counterculture was often white, male, and middle class in its public face. Fourthly, what this generational revolt in particular indicated was a rejection of the ethos of antagonism, which had dominated so much of post-war international politics, as well as the conflicts between black and white, which were so distinctively American. Students of utopia were recognized in the ethos of the counterculture, the attempt to establish a new form of community dominated by new ideals of friendship and solidarity. Such moments, liminal in their expectation of dramatic alterations in human behavior, have often been associated with moments of millenarian anticipation or the promise of salvation from without. Both the countercultural and the political sides of 1968 bore out some of this sentiment and some of these expectations. A noble ideal of common humanity still shines forth from this period, which rejects xenophobic nationalism and great power chauvinism in particular. The counterculture was genuinely a form of Gemeinschaft whose conscious target was the Gesellschaft defined by a selfish materialism. It pitted an agora against a marketplace now further defined as a mall. It recognized that communitas could be fatally overturned by consumer market forces. It acknowledged to paraphrase Mary Douglas, that if we desire goods primarily for mobilizing other people, this revealed the primacy of sociability. It recognized, too, that the gated community was a consciously utopian island in a dystopian sea, that we might see it differently here, too. It challenged the idea that the apogee of civilization was the creation of the autonomous, sovereign individual, which, of course, 
for students of liberal, social, and political thought was the great discovery of the modern period by indicating the centrality of sociability to our humanity, which is just not figured into this liberal account of the ultimate best life of human beings. So its failure does not negate the effort as such. Fifthly, while it instigated new forms of consumerism, the countercultural ethos of 1968 was a rooted rejection of the commodification of everyday life and the subordination of being to having. It condemned the elevation of shopping into a religion whose main attraction, as Bauman has noted, is the offer of plentiful new starts and resurrections, chances of being born again through the cycle of constant satisfaction of needs and the creation of new needs, and the prioritizing of luxury and brand identity the packaging rather than the functional sub substance coming to the fore. Work under capitalism had become a means to an end, but equally a soul-destroying process which brought little else but what Richard Sennett has described as the corrosion of character. We may, of course, challenge the idea that the retreat to a real self represented anything other than a variation on the ever-mutating commodified self where the whole point of consumption is constant renewal. But at the same time, the counterculture, by contrast, represented an ideal of simplified life, of authentic and direct personal communication, and of recognition of the value of the emotions and of the erotic. It challenged the claims of technologically centered society through writers like Jacques Ellul, Jean Minot, and Lewis Mumford. To the passive, mesmerizing experience epitomized in the family, sitting together in front of the TV, it posed a creative, active celebration of activity itself, or at least the alternative mesmerizing experience provided by music. Bombarded by TV advertising, which dominated much of their spare time, and thus constantly urged to consume and to work harder in order to consume more, the moderns had become mere stimulus response puppets. The engineers of their souls were advertising executives. But to the ideal of a clean, efficient technocracy, paid for by subservience to the machine, these movements juxtaposed a Luddite and humanist cry of resistance to the automation of mind and body alike. Bacon's vision of scientific domination in New Atlantis had become epitomized in the Rand Corporation, Rosak remarks. Others saw these trends as culminating, of course, in the totalitarian nightmare described in George Orwell's 1984. Sixthly, there is the issue of nature as such. The countercultural rejection of consumerism, shallow and naive though it may appear today, foreshadowed an attitude towards nature which has become indispensable to our forward movement today. What is often termed ecologism implies dramatic changes in our attitudes towards and behavior within nature, namely towards sustaining and protecting our environment while the prospect still exists and it is dwindling rapidly. The critique of technology and of technological rationality which emerged in the 1960s is now more relevant than ever as a new generation of AI-enhanced robots emerges just as the corporate ethos of efficiency maximization seems everywhere triumphant. Let me conclude then where I started. Come on, people now, smile on your brother. We're going to modify this to say sister today, too. Everybody get together, try to love one another. Some of our blood today is sadly rather older than younger, but the young bloods who... Uh, wrote this song, whose very name, of course, is evocative for everything I've been talking about <clears throat> today, uh, made a very important point, I think, in these lyrics. Much of the happy mysticism of the 1960s now seems vacuous and deluded to us. The, as Rozak puts it, the religious renewal amongst disaffected young people did not occur in most developed countries. In Britain, certainly seven out of 10 young people today have no religious belief. We are no closer to loving our neighbor than we were in AD 30 or AD 1968. Yet the drive for sociability, which accompanied it, reminds us that we've again permitted grand forces to dictate an increasingly dehumanized existence for millions. 
This is mostly simply a result of the profit maximization rationale, which lies at the heart of capitalist logic. But it also threatens today in the reduction of living standards for millions, in the increasing grinding anxiety and deteriorating working and living conditions of millions, in the face of a new wave of industrialization and resulting mass unemployment, in the intensification of the growth of inequality, there lies the prospect of a new rebellion of the many against the few. Just what this will share with 1968 remains to be seen. Whether 1968 provided the basis for a new social model remains contested and something we can talk about. But that we will again seek such a model seems eminently clear. Thank you. Listening to uh, someone talking about 1968 in 2018 um, made me uh, uh, remember 1918, and not, not as a Romanian remembering Greater Romania, the Grand Union of the Provinces, but rather looking back uh, uh, 50 years uh, from 68 uh, and looking into what. The 60, 1968 uh, counterculture and political, I would say, uh, movement was a recapitulation of things that was going on, were going on already between the wars. Mm -hmm. It is a recapitulation of cultural and anti-cultural, uh, counter-cultural, political, anti-political, counter-political streams that were already obvious shaping the world of the 1920s and especially of the 1930s. Something that is quite striking when you, when you consider the, the full century is this uh, um, extraordinary fact that 1916 seems to be a recapitulation of uh, spirituality, this quest for spirituality, for community, uh, for emotion, there is an anti-modernist ethos that was a refusal and a negation of anything that technology had promised already from the end of the 19th century, had delivered uh, before 1914, and had pushed to the apocalypse, the technological apocalypse of World War I. So, in many ways, uh, my last comment is that this is a kind of recapitulation without the memory of the history that have passed, uh, a recapitulation uh, which is uh, uh, reappearing as a kind of discovery when, in fact, it is a kind of remembering of things. And I'll just give you two examples. Just remember in the United States how all these uh, young college students who obviously didn't have any kind of uh, uh, historical or cultural memory of any sort in the United States, especially, were desperately looking for guys such as Mircea Eliade or uh, Hema Hesse, who were in many ways proposing things that had been tried before in the 1920s and 1930s. So when, in, 19, in the 1990s, there was this talk about <coughs> the 1930s being be ahead of us, the 1930s had been also uh, repeated first in many uh, interesting ways from the counter-cultural to the counter-political in the 1960s. And that, I think, uh, uh, should uh, I don't know, inf inspire us to, to look at a longer history of 1968 than has been considered, I think, to this point and look into this kind of archaeological uh, uh, dimension of 1968, which the main actors of 1968 ignored, of course, but which we cannot ignore, because they have the advantage of uh, um, this retrospective uh, gaze. So that would be my comments, and, and now the floor is open. <clears throat> and to what you do to, to your list, the fact of use 
Yes, of course. of course. Now everything, the cult of the body, of the youth, of uh, spirituality, uh, uh, the new age reinvention of everything that was Indian, Oriental, and so on. Uh, so uh, it's nice to rediscover the will, which in many ways these people were doing. I'm not sure about people who uh, uh, turned out to become the heroes, the, the old guys who are the heroes and the possible gurus of this generation, I'm not sure about their innocence. And the case of Eliade is, I think, a case in point. Uh, well, suddenly he became a hero, uh, or even a cult hero of the, of the <coughs> 1960s, uh, you know, with people going there to look for inspiration. Uh, Hesse is another. Castaneda, who was recycling elements of the same kind of spiritual uh, quest, uh, became, well, uh, shamanism, and of course, uh, uh, all these people are reading desperately and avidly uh, Eliade's take on shamanism, which was too technical, of course, to be consumed uh, massively by everybody, but who got the point that, yes, there is a certain authority which is left after the demise of every other form of authority. And that is a kind of <clears throat> mystical, shamanistic form of, uh, of the, the community leader, the tzaddik, the guru, uh, the acid guru, who knows better, who can do the trip uh, up and down, come back and tell us what the world is all about and things of this sort. So, uh, without uh, emphasizing this, because history is always new, uh, even when it happens without the memory of times past, uh, uh, history has a certain element of recapitulation of older uh, ideas and older uh, behaviors, which to me was not emphasized enough in the literature on 1968, and I just would like to put it on the table. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so thanks a lot for the fascinating talk and also for Soren Samar. I'm going to follow up on, on some of uh, you said. And what um, really, and, and this will be probably a tricky comment and question. What do you think is the general relationship of counterculture, as you have described it, uh, to modernity? Because uh, I, at least I see there a slightly ambivalence mm -hmm. in, in this relationship. On the one hand, it's anti-modernness introducing this very romantic idea of, uh, you know, going back to nature and uh, the, to, uh, uh, to be <coughs> authentic, like, naturally also. But on the other hand, it, some of them, like Marcuse and other, others, just want to reorganize, uh, you know, uh, uh, the society, politics, but they don't want to reject it <coughs> uh, in, in general. So. Uh, you know, and, and they can uh, criticize technique and technocracy, but at the same time, they are still thinking in the sense of like progressive civilization that will overcome the dangers of technical civilization of, of the atomic bomb, yeah. and that will become more developed than, than in, in this era, which in fact is a very modern idea. Right? So that would be my question. With technology coming as a solution to the to the ideological political issues, which is a theme coming up from the 1950s already, uh, right. uh, and technology uh, maturing around 1970, yeah. when it exploded as the possible solution to everything. So that is a, mo a kind of neo modernist uh, attitude to uh, Yeah, I mean these are countervailing and potentially, of course, extraordinarily contradictory trends. Yeah. Uh, I think if you just look at the numbers, relatively few people do end up dropping out and going for the simplification of life ideal, which is there in those terms in the 1890s already, to go back to the generation mm -hmm. before yes. the First World War. If you think of what the most potent symbol of the entire epoch is, it's the electric guitar, mm -hmm. the harnessing of music to the machine. Mm -hmm. More than anything else, that's what made it possible to have concerts with tens of thousands of people. And of course, the whole concept itself, the music is totally deafening. It's all encompassing. It becomes an experience through the penetration into the body of the sound itself in a way which has never been previously possible, unless you're right up next to the musician in a state of spiritual ecstasy yourself. 
So this, for the majority of people, the adaptation was the counterculture as an adjunct to the forward progressive movement of mainstream society. <coughs> Uh, modifying it in some respects, but this is, of course, also one of the reasons why, if, if it had been uh, at its foundation and centrally always anti-technological, uh, it would have had a relatively small chance of ever progressing very far, whereas its impact, we all acknowledge today, was very great. But of course it's all, because look at the way we speak, look at the way we dress, look at the music we listen to, we are all uh, inheriting this generation. We all wear jeans, I mean, we all wear the uniform that was then the counterculture's uniform. Uh, but none of this conflicts today with living a life in the mainstream society. So quite to the contrary, this is the mainstream yeah. society. Uh, and this is also a disguise for those who want to live uh, happy, affluent, bourgeois lives but posing, want also to pose as an alternative, yes, exactly. Yes, indeed. Easy. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, I have a question. I also want to add something. We are 50 years after. Uh, I'm myself 50 years, and my children are not 50 years, but uh, they are part of it. Uh, you know that uh, a part of the population are try is trying to rebuild something. Not, not the liberation has made a lot of effects, and now they are trying to keep part of this effect: freedom, uh, autonomy of the uh, of the person, but trying to rebuild something. And you know that politically, I don't know in in England, but in France, there is a very huge reaction against what happened in '68 because it left everything open, we say destroyed, mm -hmm. and uh, they have no, no idea how to rebuild it and keep something, and keep the culture. And uh, I have also no idea, <laughs> but uh, uh, if we are speaking 50 years after uh, 68, I think we have to add this question to the, what happened in this period. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, I mean, one of the, the main things I try to stress here is where you are today, as well as where you were then, mm -hmm. completely alters your perception of all these movements. The singularity of national developments, especially. I don't think, for most of the movements I talked about originated or developed primarily in the, in the United States. Had the United States suffered the damage of the First and Second World Wars on its own <coughs> soil, the story would have been completely different, of course. And it's quite doubtful whether these movements would have emerged in the way they did. It's precisely because the United States had this unique position of privilege and of affluence that these movements occur. There the parallel today is very worrying, which is why the question I left us with at the end was, if we anticipate another rebellion coming, which I think is pretty clearly the case, it won't take the same form for the very simple reason that we don't have the same degree of affluence as we had in 1968. The, the possibility of students going out of the Sorbonne straight to a decent job after being on the barricades is not there anymore. So, uh, and again, I think in every country, the exact situation of a particular generation now will uh, lead to a new interpretation of what will happen in the future. Let alone the absence of uh, the proletariat itself, Let which alone. was yes. still yes. an illusion in 1968. Right. The precariat is hardly uh, a, a, a force that uh, yeah. you know stu rebellious students could uh, could re uh, recoup. Um, I would uh, stop here this panel. Thank you, thanking you once again.